Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, Since we are all still theoretically in isolation, which means if you're not doing it and you're not considered an essential person who has to do their job to keep society running, please get into isolation. Uh, (laughs) But since we are all theoretically in isolation, I thought it might be nice to talk about somebody who traveled the world, which is Annie Londonderry. She gained fame for being the first woman cyclist to circumnavigate the globe on her bike. Sort of. Uh, Which is also why I think it's a fun one for this time where a lot of serious things are happening because uh, her trip is a little, uh, you'll hear. (laughs) Specious. It it is. And it's it's fun. It's a fun episode, which I think is always good. Everybody needs a break. Uh, So in the 1890s, she set off from Boston on a trip to do exactly that, to travel the world, uh, circumnavigate the globe on a bike. And she did circle the globe. But there are a lot of inconsistencies in the details of her story, including why she did it in the first place. So she was born in 1870 or 1871 in Latvia, and her name when she was born was Annie Cohen. Her parents, Levy and Beatrice Cohen, moved to the U.S. when Annie was still very young. That was in 1875. They also brought her siblings, Sarah and Bennett, And the family lived pretty modestly in a tenement in Boston's West End, which at the time was one of the most ethnically mixed neighborhoods in the country. Annie's father, Levy, died when she was just a teenager in 1887, and her mother, Beatrice, died two months after that. And this left Annie and her brother, Bennett, to care for the two siblings that had been born after the family moved to the United States, Jacob and Rosa. Annie's sister, Sarah, had already married and moved to Maine and was starting a family of her own. Annie married a young peddler named Max Kopchowski one year later in 1888. The first four years of their marriage were really productive. They had three children, Bertha Malky, who they called Molly, Libby, and Simon. Annie also worked. She sold advertising space for several of the papers around Boston, and she was really good at this job. She had a gift for conversation, so she was really able to build relationships and rapport with advertisers and sell all this ad space. Yeah, keep in mind, this is not a time where it it would have been that out of character for an immigrant family to have both parents working. Annie was not that unusual in being a mother that also worked. Annie claimed in 1894 that two businessmen had made a huge wager involving $20,000 that a woman couldn't bicycle around the globe in 15 months and that she was chosen as the one to attempt it. And if she did manage to do this, she would also get $10,000. And in addition to that requirement that she had to circle the globe on a bike In 15 months, she also had to make a living for herself along the way, with a target total of $5,000. On June 15th of 1894, Annie was ready to set out on this journey. She had a big send-off in Boston. People who knew her personally were on hand to say goodbye, but so were a lot of curious onlookers, as well as a number of suffragettes. They were all there to see what seemed like it would be history in the making. The head of Pope Manufacturing, which produced Columbia brand bicycles, was on hand as well. And he had a bicycle that the company was giving her for this journey. A woman taking on a challenge like this was, of course, big news. So this really was a huge event. There were speeches given. It was covered by the press. These farewell speeches marked what a momentous thing they were all witnessing, which would be a, a huge help in the fight for equality for women. And Annie made her own speech, explaining the whole story that the trip was the result of a wager and declaring that, quote, I am to go around the earth in 15 months, returning with $5,000 and starting only with the clothes on my back. I cannot accept anything gratuitously from anyone. One of her friends offered her a penny for luck, which Annie said she could not take. And then the woman, Mrs. Tubbs, told her that she could take it as payment for wearing the white ribbon of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which Mrs. Tubbs placed on Annie's lapel. In a similarly ceremonious act, she was given $100 from the Londonderry Lithia Spring Water Company. Having made that investment, the company got to put a sign on the rear wheel skirt guard on this Columbia bike 
And Annie would take on the name Londonderry for this journey. So this is like a very interesting ad deal on her own bike in person. Yes. When you look at, for example, like professional race cars now, and they have stuff all over their cars and all over their persons, like their jumpsuits, Annie was a big starting (laughs) point of all of this. That name change that she made to Londonderry offered her some pretty key additional benefits. For one, it meant that she was not going to be a woman traveling alone with a Jewish last name. That was something that would have added a significant layer of danger in the 1890s. Additionally, for this excursion, Annie had made the decision to keep her personal life very private. She never mentioned that she was a married woman with children, and that was something that allowed her to sort of craft her own narrative around her identity as she went. And finally, it was just easier for most English-speaking people, and particularly the press covering this, to say and remember the name Londonderry than Kupchovsky. And Annie was nothing if not savvy about public image and the power of word of mouth. She also never seemed to have any difficult feelings about leaving her family behind while she made this trip. She was later quoted on several different occasions saying, quote, I didn't want to spend my life at home with a baby under my apron every year. Max's feelings on his wife's trip are not really known, although reportedly he really adored his wife, probably wanted her to do whatever would make her happy. Annie told the papers that Max was, quote, perfectly willing that she go or that she wouldn't have done it. Incidentally, Max, who was also an immigrant, was petitioning to become a U.S. citizen, and he was actually sworn in while she was on the road. Yeah, there was, uh, in the, the main biography I read of her, Max is described as basically worshiping her. And incidentally, Annie did not leave Boston on the day of that big send-off event. She stayed there for two more days, getting photos taken of her with her bike uh, to be printed in bulk so that she could sell them as souvenirs along the way. And she also printed out handbills that told her whole story and that she could kind of let people circulate throughout town so they knew to look for her. On June 27th, she said her true goodbyes to a much more intimate gathering of close friends and family. And then she finally left and headed to New York. So she was starting this trip in the summer of 1894. And that was around the same time that our previous podcast subject, Frank Lenz, disappeared on his cycling trip around the world. If you uh, may recall, if you've heard that episode, or if you haven't, Lenz was really eager to finish this journey as quickly as possible, and he decided to take a more dangerous route through Turkey to get to Europe instead of taking the safer but longer route through Russia. He vanished along the way. Uh, Annie, as you'll see, did not uh, do things like that. (laughs) Now, unlike Lenz and other cyclists who had tried and some succeeded to circumnavigate the globe, Annie was not really experienced at riding bicycles. And the bike that she had to start with wasn't actually great for what lay ahead. It was quite heavy and it was lumbering and on sandy surfaces or rocky substrate, she often just had to get off and push it rather than ride it. So this first leg of her trip from Boston to New York was really arduous. And maybe because of that, Annie stayed in New York for several weeks afterward. That made some people worried she was never going to be able to make her deadline. One of the ways that she spent those weeks was revising her outfit. She'd initially started with a day suit that included full skirts, but she decided by the time she got to New York that that was just not practical. I can't imagine... The difficulty of trying to just ride a bike a long way in full skirts all the time. Here's my thing. (laughs) As a modern person who is very accustomed to the benefit of a lot of textile advancements and who has run a lot, I am wimpy if I get the mildest chafe on like a 20-mile run, which I haven't done in a long time. Like, I can't imagine how chafy and uncomfortable a suit that was not made for sporting. Right. Oh, it sounds There's miserable. a lot. It's layers of difficulty with this. Yes. Dress. So she adopted instead, while she was in New York, she switched it out for a suit with a pair of bloomers. She still wore a skirt over it, but it was a little bit shorter. It was only ankle length. And that new skirt could be pinned up if she needed to while riding. She abandoned corsets uh, at this point, which I think is a wise move, and wore rubber-soled boots for added comfort. 
And she also started carrying a revolver in case she was going to need to defend herself. Although she also, just as she had no bicycling experience, didn't really have any firearms experience either. Uh, Just in case folks are visualizing this, when we say bloomers, we're talking about the, like, blousy divided pants or, you know, bifurcated pant wear that was advocated by dress reformers. We're not talking about underwear. Right. Just in case. After all that time in New York, Annie continued with her journey, and we will talk about that after we pause for a sponsor break. So when Annie Londonderry finally left New York at the end of July, a crowd of several hundred people waved her goodbye, just as had been the case in Boston. En route to Chicago from there, Annie quickly learned that the road was just not going to be kind to her. She rarely found places to wash her clothes, which became oppressively smelly in the summer heat as she rode and was sweating. And when she did manage to stay in a hotel or a boarding house and wash her clothes in the sink, they were never dry by the time she left in the morning. So off she went in wet clothes, which sounds miserable. That also means that if it rained, she just had to gut it out in sopping wet layers. And even without corsets and without her full-length skirt layers, this became very heavy and very arduous. Because remember, this was all wool. This all sounds just so incredibly stinky and chafy and awful. (laughs) She made her way to Rochester and then Buffalo and then slowly on to Cleveland before trying to make up the time by hurrying to Chicago, where she finally arrived on September 24th. That was a full three months after she had left Boston. She weighed 20 pounds less than she had at the start of the trip. She was still really struggling with issues regarding her clothing just being too cumbersome. And at this point, she was very well aware that she only had 12 months left on her claim that she could go around the entire world in 15 months. <laughs> not not divided very evenly at this point. No, it's it seems like she maybe made some foolish time management decisions <laughs> right out of the gate. Uh, So the intent had been that she would continue to travel in a westerly direction. But because of her rough start, owing to her lack of experience and maybe a little bit of dawdling, by the time she arrived in Chicago, it was too late in the year to keep going west. If she tried to continue in the direction that she was going starting that late in the year, she was going to have to cross North America in the winter, which was not realistic. She publicly said she was done at this point. The New York Times ran a piece on October 11th that Annie wasn't going to complete her trip. She turned around, headed to New York, retracing her route in reverse, but this time she was going for a speed record. But before she even started that, um, (laughs) even though she had announced that she was turning around and going to New York... While she was still in Chicago recovering from those three months on the road and planning for this speed run to New York... Annie visited the Sterling Cycle Works, and they offered her a new bicycle that was about 20 to 21 pounds. That was less than half of the weight of the bike that she had been riding up to that point. And they also offered her a sponsorship deal if she would put their sign on her bicycle uh, instead of riding the Columbia and having them as a sponsor. Morgan and Wright Tire Company, which also worked with Sterling, also joined on as a sponsor. So this whole change really lifted her spirits, and she changed her mind again. She thought she could actually circle the globe. The new plan was to go to New York as planned and then go east from there. In addition to the new bicycle, her choice of clothing changed again. This was sort of a double necessity. Even though her starting skirt had been switched out to something more practical, The new Sterling was a men's bike that was built differently. She just couldn't ride it with her skirt fabric bunching up in front of her. It was pretty hazardous. So she finally did the thing that she had been too demure to do when her trip started, and that was to get rid of that skirt and to just use the bloomers. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, the men's bicycle was built with a segment that went directly from the handlebars back to the seat, whereas the ladies' bike she had been riding before that did not have that. It kind of had a dip, uh, like a curved uh, metal section where like her skirts could settle in front of her instead of wadding up. And so uh, that was what caused that change. And while this was all very freeing to switch to bloomers only, there were definitely people who found this whole idea utterly scandalous. 
Uh, fortunately, some of her sponsors sent her additional outfits so that she would have a change of clothes and she could wear comfortable gear while riding, but also dress appropriately for appearances or social engagements on the road. So with this new clothing and a much lighter bike, it was a lot easier for Annie to go back to New York. She continued to be a draw for the press. The Buffalo Express ran a piece on her on November 1st, 1894, that noted that she had many sponsorships. Quote, the young woman is a sort of riding advertising agency. She wears ribbons advertising various goods and will receive $400 for one firm's ad that graces her left breast. On her right bloomer leg, she carries $100 worth of advertisements, and she has just closed a contract to cover her left arm. She says her back is for rent yet, and she hopes to get $300 for it. She must not beg a cent, and she makes enough money to pay for her board by selling little souvenir brownie pins and other souvenirs of the trip. That same article, incidentally, includes some other fascinating tidbits about Annie that were 100% total fabrications, including saying that she had attended Harvard and studied medicine. Yeah, she uh, she had started embellishing her story at that point. Uh, that article, with embellishments included, was no outlier. And it actually gets a little bit tricky to separate the actual events of her ride from the stories that she told at her various speaking engagements and to reporters. Annie was a spectacular storyteller, and she was very, very comfortable adding a little bit of flourish to her story to wow crowds. So while some elements of her story and what happened on this trip are documented through the papers of the day, even those are not always trustworthy. Obviously, she couldn't just bike across the ocean, so she took a steamer to Europe, France specifically, sailing to Le Havre and on a steamer called La Touraine. That steamer trip was not to be her last, not by a long shot, but that's all well before she reached the Pacific Ocean where she'd need to take a boat by necessity. Yeah, uh, (laughs) there's a lot of steamer travel coming up. So once she got to France, uh, she biked from Paris to Marseille, and that was a well-publicized trip, and it was followed by both the French and the global papers. She was escorted the whole way by guides that had been arranged by France's various cycling clubs. French journalists tended to criticize her appearance. The nicest thing that they said about her was that she seemed energetic. One paper in Lyon described her as a neutered being because they couldn't describe her as having feminine or masculine traits. Uh, And that was definitely in a a derogatory way. They weren't saying, oh, she's androgynous and cool. They were like, ugh, we don't know what to do with her. But the public was fascinated by her and completely embraced her. So it seems like once Annie was outside the U.S., she felt totally free to tell all kinds of lies about her background. She told France's reporters that she was an orphan, a medical student, a law student, and an heiress, among a lot of other things. It's unclear whether she was just kind of having some fun goading reporters into filing false stories, or uh, if she maybe just wanted to play fast and loose with the truth. While in Valence, France, her Achilles tendon in one leg became inflamed, so she rested there. And while she was doing that, her bike was put on display in a shop window so she could have time to convalesce and I think also make a little money from that placement. By the time she reached Marseille, uh, after she recovered, she continued on. She was quite enjoying herself, despite feeling that her initial reception in France had kind of treated her poorly. At Marseille, she boarded the steamer Sydney on January 20th, 1895. And then the story gets really fuzzy, because just seven weeks later, on March 9th, she boarded another ship that was leaving Japan. That means that the same woman who spent three entire months getting from Boston to Chicago somehow covered the entire Asian continent where she did not speak any of the languages in half that time. Uh, That seems real fishy. Yeah. (laughs) This seems like when... uh, Like when the marathon is happening and somebody crosses the starting line with the marathon and then like like they get in a cab. (laughs) It's exactly like that. Uh, So if you heard Annie Londonderry speak of her travels or read her account, it was a very full seven weeks. According to her, that time was filled with bike rides through Jerusalem and tiger hunts and visits with royalty and being mistaken for an evil spirit in some lands and having to disguise herself in local garb to not be chased and even traveling to the front lines of the First Sino-Japanese War. 
We're going to talk about that part in a minute. But none of this was true. (laughs) Uh, The slides that she would later show during lectures of her travels were professional photographs that had been taken of those places and that she had purchased. They were not photos she had taken herself. So what it seems really happened was she got on the Sydney, and then it made port in Alexandria, and then Port Said in Egypt, and then Colombo in Sri Lanka. Annie and two other lady cyclists from the ship raised some eyebrows when they went out for a ride at that stop. And then after that quick stop in Sri Lanka, the Sydney sailed on to Singapore with Annie Londonderry still on board. Yeah. Uh, Just for the historical record, Sri Lanka would have been called Ceylon at this time. Uh, Annie's arrival in Singapore did not go exactly as she might have hoped. And we're going to talk about that after we have a word from our sponsors. So when Annie arrived in Singapore... The press there noticed that she had made shockingly good time crossing Asia and actually called her out on it. On February 14th of 1895, an article in the Singapore Straits ran that was titled A Woman on Wheels, 50,000 Fools at Marseille, which made the case that Annie was a charlatan on a trip to gain money and fame and that she had duped the French. It pointed out how the French public had fawned over her and bought her photographs and paid her to endorse their products and then cheered her as she left port. And then it compared her journey to that of French mail, sailing safely aboard the steamship Sydney. The next stop was Saigon, and things were a little better there, in part because a French periodical called Le Courrier was eagerly awaiting her with some prearranged appearances. But even as this reception was an improvement, her write-ups back home were starting to sour a little bit. Uh, The U.S. press was wondering how Annie had made such good time crossing Asia. She next hit Hong Kong for a couple days, and then Shanghai, where she invited the editor of the newspaper Celestial Empire to call on her at her hotel so that she could do an interview and give him a full account of her travels. But what she actually did was explain to him how well she had been greeted in other cities. A lot of that was lies that she made up. And to make clear to him that she expected the same in Shanghai, kind of hinting that he should help arrange that. That editor left the hotel. (laughs) It was from Shanghai that she said she had traveled to the front of the Sino-Japanese War, later writing, quote, I was warned to get out of the country as quickly as possible, but my American spirit was up and I was determined to see the fun. So I determined to go to the front, and I went. I knew that I could fill any hall in the United States with the announcement that I was an eyewitness to the battles in China. She continues a paragraph later. I was an eyewitness to the Battle of Ghassan. It was the first I had seen, and I don't want to see another. All of that, again, not true. No, totally made it up. Uh, Annie arrived in Yokohama, Japan in early March. There, she had some conflict with the American consul, John McLean, because she asked him if he could help her raise funds for her passage across the Pacific. He was not particularly interested in assisting her in this way. She actually kind of had him smeared in the press for it uh, as not caring about any American citizens. She did manage to wrangle some assistance and some cash from the French consul, however, and booked passage aboard the Belgique, which took her to San Francisco. Annie arrived in California, ready to start booking speaking engagements and telling her tales of life abroad on her bicycle, and she did. She also met with a lot of suspicion and criticism. One of the big issues right out of the gate was the psychometer on her bicycle, which indicated that the bike had been ridden a total of about 7,280 miles. That did not add up to what one should have expected on a trip around the world, even including the necessary segments that had to be covered by ship, like across the entire Pacific Ocean. Additionally, the amount of money that she earned along the way did not quite add up. While Annie claimed that she would have to make about $3,500 of the $5,000 required by that bet on her way from San Francisco across the USA on her final leg... People that were kind of keeping track of her her travels and keeping a tally noted that she had already earned a lot more than she was reporting. And her war stories from China did not really line up with the calendar timeline of what had been playing out in that conflict. So more and more of her story seemed shady as people started to compare notes. 
A newspaper editor from Indiana met with Annie in California and wrote rather scathingly of her, quote, Miss Londonderry's trip has been a remarkable one from the fact that she went entirely around the world on steamboats, according to her own story, accepting a ride from Havre to Marseille, France, on her wheel. Miss Anna is a hustler for sure. Annie's story had been refined as she tried to adjust to accommodate that cyclometer reading and to include the fact that a lot of her travel was by steamer. In a lot of segments in the press, she quickly went from being lauded as the epitome of the new woman to being criticized as a fraud and huckster. Yeah, it was kind of one of those things where it was like, oh, no, well, I did take the steamer from here to there, but then I got off and I ran up here and I did this. And it, it was like, then there was calendar math that just didn't add up. It's like, you couldn't have done that in that period of time before the Sydney took off at the next port. There were a lot of problems. But after spending almost two months in California, during which she managed to stage a photo of herself being robbed by alleged bandits, which she then used that photo on her lecture tour, she finally continued east to finish her trip. And if that seems like a long time to stay there when the clock was ticking on this bet, it sure was. There is the possibility that she may have had a romance during this time with a fellow cyclist, a gentleman named Mark Johnson from San Francisco's Olympic Cycling Club, who insisted on making the ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles with her. That ride took five weeks, so it meant that they averaged less than 10 miles a day on their bikes even accounting for an accident that happened early on. This seemed pretty slow to a lot of people, and some folks started pointing out that they actually might have done better on foot. People were even dubious about her trip across North America. There were rumors that if you asked railroad men if they'd seen her, they would say nothing but kind of give you a knowing wink. Finally, after lecturing and riding her way across the continent, she made her way home, and then the following brief article appeared in the New York Times on September 25th of 1895. It was titled, Miss Londonderry's Trip Ended, and it is uh, tagged Boston, Massachusetts. Miss Annie Londonderry arrived in the city this morning after a trip around the world on a bicycle. Miss Londonderry is nursing a broken arm, the result of a bad fall sustained in one of the western towns. On June 25th, 1894, she started her trip around the world. She was given a good send-off by several hundred friends who were at the state house where the start was made. Her trip, she says, was made upon a wager. She was to receive $10,000 if she finished the journey in 15 months, and she feels proud of the record she has made. On Thursday, September 12th, the journey came to an end in Chicago, 14 days ahead of the time allowed. In addition to the purse of $10,000, which she says was handed over by the parties making the wager, Miss Londonderry also accumulated $5,000 from lectures given in the several countries and also by participating in exhibitions of bicycle riding. This announcement was featured in the New York Times over an article collecting more general cycling news of the day, including the announcement that previous podcast subject Hetty Green, the richest woman in America, had also started riding a bicycle. So uh, we've already said a lot of this is, is fibs on her part, outright lies. So how much of Annie's story was true? <laughs> Probably not much of it at all. Uh, in fact, it's entirely possible that even the wager that was supposed to have set this whole trip in motion never existed. The story of the wager between two men, the 10000 prize to her if she accomplished this goal, and the $5,000 earnings requirement was one that Annie told everywhere she went, and it seemed to shift and grow and change along the way. At some stops, she told people that she was forbidden as part of this bet from speaking any language but English. And in other places, she claimed that she had to forego taking any work as a journalist since that was already her profession and that using that to make the $5,000 requirement would be considered cheating. The first appearance of the story in a newspaper was in February of 1894 with the headline that read, A Woman to Rival Paul Jones. Paul Jones was a fake name adopted by a young man named E.C. Pfeiffer, was someone who had claimed that just a couple of weeks earlier that on a wager he would walk around the world in a year. That enterprise had already fallen apart and had been revealed as fake when this second story hit the news. The article in the Boston Daily Globe didn't mention Annie by name, but described a young woman who, like her, was in her 20s, worked for the papers, and was going to make a trip by bicycle around the world in 15 months on a wager. 
Yeah, it's one of those things where because she did work in the newspaper industry, it's entirely possible that she finagled some connections to have this story placed. The two businessmen that were allegedly backing this wager were never clearly identified. Uh, She spat out a couple names here and there, and sometimes names appeared in various articles, but no one ever took responsibility for this huge bet. And even when the story was breaking and Annie was wildly popular, there were already articles that questioned the veracity of this whole thing. Still, Annie ignored all of this and carried on with her plan, although it seems like it was maybe a plan entirely her own and no one else was ever involved. She never, for example, gave any proof of receipt of that $10,000 payment. Uh, She just stated to the press that she had received it and the payment had been made. Also, Annie Kupchowski had been living a pretty mundane life at the time this whole thing started, With plenty of high-profile members of the women's movement at hand in Boston at the time, it would have been really random for Annie, who wasn't particularly active in that movement in any sort of official capacity, to somehow find herself at the middle of this high-stakes wager over the matter of women's equality. But all the various aspects of her story were really enticing to the press and to the readers. The wager, the additional earnings requirement, the time limit, and everything suggests that this was really very carefully crafted. In October 1895, so after her trip was over, a story ran in the New York Sunday World detailing Annie's entire adventure. And the byline read, Nellie Bly Jr., borrowing the name of the real journalist Nellie Bly, who became famous for her asylum expose, Ten Days in a Madhouse, in the 1880s, and who also had taken a trip around the world. But in this case, Nellie Bly Jr. was Annie, further stoking the fires of her own story. When Annie's trip around the world ended and the press about it died down, she settled into a less adventurous life again, sort of, She had a brief foray in the fall of 1895 where she helped to capture a so-called wild man who had been terrorizing the town of Royalston, Massachusetts. Her work on the case was, of course, very embellished in her own telling. And then she moved her family to New York, where she started writing under the nom de plume, The New Woman, for a while, uh, for the papers there. She and Max added to their family with another baby in 1897. But Annie had a hard time adjusting to her post-travel life. She was most likely restless, and she was the frequent recipient of correspondence from friends and family who, believing that she had come into this great sum of money at the end of her journey, wanted financial help. Eventually, Annie left her family again for a while. She traveled to Northern California to work as a saleswoman in a town called Ukiah, The details of what led her there are pretty mysterious, but in the early 1900s, she went back home to Max, and the family opened a retail clothing store in the Bronx. Yeah, she kind of settled into this retail life after that. Uh, There was a fire in the 1920s that destroyed the family business, so it really went on for quite some time. But even after that, soon Annie opened another retail business. This time she used the insurance money from that fire, but she also had a business partner. Uh, This was a gentleman whose name was Feldman. And apparently it was just a stranger that she had struck up a conversation with in a restaurant, and the two of them hit it off and decided to go into business together. Annie's husband, Max, died in 1946. They'd been married for 58 years. Annie continued on with life and work for the next year, and then she died after a stroke on November 11th, 1947. Even today, Annie's true motivations for what seemed like a stunt remain a matter of speculation. She does seem to have been interested in clothing reform for women, but as we said just a moment ago, she hadn't been active in the women's movement in general. Even taking into account her easier travels by boat and train, traveling the world alone was a difficult undertaking. So she may have had myriad other reasons to go out into the world and leave her family behind. It could have been just as simple as wanting to shake off her expected role of wife and mother and have an adventure, which she surely did. And some people still categorize her as, you know, making this incredibly feminist move in doing so, even if this whole thing was a farce in terms of setup. And there is no doubt that she was searching for notoriety and money as part of her drive in all of this. It is one of those things where, unfortunately, her correspondence does not survive like she was writing letters home but none of it has been found any letters that she received on the road do not seem to have been 
maintained in any sort of way. So there are a lot of uh, elements of guesswork in terms of of what was really going on in her head during all of this. Oh, Annie. Yeah. <laughs> She's sort of a marvelous fibber. <laughs> um, it's a fun story. But only part of it happened. <laughs> Very little of it actually happened. I mean, she went on a cruise around the world, which sounds pretty great. But yeah, she didn't She didn't do all the things she claimed to do. There is, you can find online, and there is a book written about her, which is uh, written by, I believe, her, what would be her great nephew, uh, which is a pretty fabulous biography and, and one of my primary sources for this. And you can see that photograph that she staged of being robbed. <laughs> by bandits and there's that whole moment of like here's this woman there are two men holding her at gunpoint like one has a shotgun i think and it's like well who's taking the picture instead of helping you (laughs) (laughs) i'm just gonna take this photograph this lady looks like she's in peril um but she's certainly uh she's a little bit of um you know a baron munchausen in that way in the Mm -hmm. (laughs) In the film thing, not related to the disease named after him, mm-hmm. uh, or the syndrome, rather. Uh, yeah, who wouldn't want to have a fun adventure? You don't have to fib about it. Cruise around the world sounds great. <laughs> um, I have listener mail that actually just came in while we were recording, but it so perfectly dovetails on this that I thought it, we might as well use it. Uh, it's from our listener, Jessica, and she says, Howdy, ladies, just listen to your transatlantic cruising podcast. See, it ties in and heard a mention of my current company, Hopag. I hear we are still offering cruises specifically in Europe, but I work in the shipping cargo portion now called Hopag Lloyd. I wanted to send a quick note and say thanks for making my drives to see clients always interesting and keep up the great work. Um, uh, that was just too good in terms of fortuitous timing to have a, a company that we have talked about related to cruising on the show at the time when we were talking about Annie's steamer cruise around the world. <laughs> and also by total coincidence at a time when many of the major, I don't know if it's all of them at this point, but like all the major cruise lines operating from U.S. ports have stopped. Mm-hmm. And we will see when when we are back to cruising. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, that sounds grand. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.